A judge says Texas is not doing enough to protect children in foster care, and she's ordering the state to pay big fines that could add up to millions of dollars. I think she's saying, look, you're not spending dollars on kids where it really matters within the system, so I'm gonna have you paying outside of it. We look at the history behind the penalties and the impact on young Texans. It's one of the biggest races on the Texas primary ballot. Which Democrat gets to challenge John Cornyn next year? To them, I would say they should be afraid because it's gonna be this proud immigrant daughter that unseats John Cornyn. We'll introduce you to one of the top candidates and show you who has the early edge in the polls. Hello, and thank you for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. $100,000 a day. That's the amount a judge ordered the state of Texas to pay until changes are made to the foster care system. In 2015, Judge Janice Jack ruled the system was broken and gave the state some orders. That includes around the clock supervision by adults who are awake for foster children in a group setting. Judge Jack said Tuesday the state failed to implement the new rules. She said if the state didn't fix the problems, the state will be fined $50,000. The amount would double later this month until the foster care system changes. While the system works for the majority of children, there are unsolved problems. The final piece is, is that we do a bad job of working with kids whose parents' rights have been terminated and are now essentially um, wards of the state. That these are kids who we could potentially find adoptive homes for, but there are some who may not ever be adopted. And we have to support those kids. We have to let them know that they have resources and supports and tools and all of the things that they need to become those healthy, um, thriving adults that they want to be. And our system does not do a great job of that. And so I think our legislature and I think our state really needs to look at, do we have enough resources there? And do we maybe need to put some more money into um, kids who are um, in care and who are aging out of care? And I think that's a big conversation we need to have next session. The Texas Attorney General's office says the Department of Family and Protective Services have been working to comply with the new rules. For Insight, we're joined by Bob Garrett, the Austin Bureau Chief for the Dallas Morning News. You've been covering this story for a while. There is a lot of history. What are some of the actions that Judge Stack has done in the past? Well, she f held a bench trial in 2014 and lasted two weeks. And she basically took a year to write a very long opinion. And she said, there's been 20 years of blue ribbon studies uh, that Texas foster care needs this, it needs that, and nothing's happened. So guess what? I'm gonna make some stuff happen finding a constitutional violation here. And that is a uh, 14th Amendment uh, substantive due process finding that these kids are, are being exposed to harm and, and lack of safety. Why hasn't the state implemented the orders? The state has taken a um, high-risk gamble, I think, that they could beat this lawsuit. When Greg Abbott was attorney general, he challenged all these aspects of, of how the class of kids was certified in a class action suit, really wonky lawyer stuff. Uh, that had uh, the effect of delaying it by two or three years, but it, it lumbered on. It did not kill the suit. And then more than any other state that's been sued by this outfit, Children's Rights out of New York City, Texas fought it tooth and nail. So the, the state position has been not to settle, not to yield an inch, and in the end, they didn't succeed in completely crushing the lawsuit, so they have a, a federal judge in their business. So, I mean, that kind of leads me to wonder, will the state actually pay the fines or will they just appeal the case? They've not been answering my questions about that. Um, I don't think they're on good grounds to appeal because the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans specifically on this point about having adults awake at night in group settings to make sure kids weren't raping or harming one another. Uh, they upheld her twice on this. So uh, I don't know where you go if you're a lawyer advising the governor of Texas, uh, but we'll see. Now reading your stories, it seemed like the judge was angry, like this was personal for her. Um, what's the backstory there? She had, as a private uh, practice lawyer in Corpus Christi, some family law cases that brought her into contact with CPS and the foster care system. Uh, we believe that, that she carried a passion for, for these kids to the bench, and this is pretty much her case in, in uh, semi-retired status that she has uh, been involved with now for close to a decade. And uh, she, I think, is in, intends to see it through. 
Now, whether you can overhaul a complex, vast system like this through a lawsuit is another matter, if, uh, whether you can do that effectively. But she's definitely now got the ability to, to send her monitors in and, and see everything going on and uh, make orders. And the state can either comply or try to appeal again. Now, the state uh, says it needs a little more time. Are they making progress? I mean, kids are still waiting, falling through the cracks during that process. Yeah, that's one of the problems is we have a highly privatized system, so the state uh, hands these kids off to private providers, and it really doesn't know for sure what's going on every day. So when it gets hauled into court and asked, like, do you have adult nighttime supervision in every one of these group settings, they, they don't really have an answer. They can say, well, we're sent out emails and they're trying to get a procedures and everyone to agree, but they don't, that the judge just was livid the other day that, and, and browbeat the state that you really don't know what's happening with these kids. And it is a, a troubling thing because of the way our system has evolved and highly privatized. All right, Bob, thank you very much. Thank State you. officials announced they're taking control of the largest school district in Texas. The takeover of the Houston Independent School District is unprecedented in its scope. Our John Dapkovich spoke with Ross Ramsey of the Texas Tribune to get insight on why the state's taking over. What happened to precipitate this? Well, Houston ISD has a lot of problems. They've got problems in governance. They've been violating the Open Meetings Act. You know, the, the Texas Education Agency has some problems with the way the, the board has been handling business. And they have several schools that are persistently performing, you know, underperforming. And, you know, the state has the state law says if a district has a school that's underperforming for a certain number of years, you can take over the school or you can take over the district. In this case, they've decided because of the governance problems to take over the district. Superintendent will be out. The school board will be out. HISD has one last shot at an appeal. It doesn't look very good for them. Do you get the sense that this is something the state does reluctantly they really want to try other options before they step in and do something yeah like they've this. done a lot and they've these schools have been underperforming for years and years and the state's been saying you know you need to fix that you need to fix that persisting in this HISD has had, had a lot of warning that this was coming mm -hmm. and here we are at the precipice all right Russ Ramsey Texas Tribune thank you very much we appreciate it thanks it's time to make it official candidates just started filing to run for U.S. Senate We'll look at who's getting support from Texas voters now in the race to challenge incumbent Senator John Cornyn in 2020. Voters just made it much harder for lawmakers to add a state income tax. Why that has some people worried about where the state will find revenue when Texas needs more money. Texas voters made it much more difficult for lawmakers to impose a state income tax. Voters approved a change to the Texas Constitution. The result raises the bar to implement an income tax. Now it would take a two thirds supermajority in both the Texas House and Senate and then a majority vote from the public. With an income tax out of the picture, Wes Rappaport explores what other sources of revenue state leaders could turn to if Texas needs more money. Texas sent a, a loud, clear message to the people in this building, politicians, that they can spend their money better than we can, and uh, Prop 4 proves that. Three quarters of voters raised the bar to impose a state income tax. Plano Republican Representative Jeff Leach wrote the proposal, and it had the support of all of the state's Republicans in both chambers and a handful of House Democrats. But it drew criticism from some teachers. The biggest concern is just the elimination of the guarantees to, to reduce property taxes um, and, and fund public education if at any point in the future, you know, Texans well, were decided to, through a vote, um, you know, adopt the state income tax. Prop 4 takes away the constitutional guarantee that any future state income tax would help buy down school property taxes and pay for public education. Just this past session, um, we put nearly $12 billion into public education. Leach touts this year's investment in Texas education, but political group Progress Texas worries about the years when the budget is tighter. Texas being a two-tax system, that means either property taxes or sale taxes are going to give. We don't have a revenue problem in this state. Uh, we, we do need to pay for the core competencies of government, public education, transportation, health care, uh, our courts, criminal justice system, all the things that the state government does and is, needs to do well. But we've got the revenue we need now. We need to continue to, to invest in and grow the Texas economy for the future. I'm Wes Rappaport for State of Texas. 
Turnout landed around 12% of registered voters, meaning about 1.5 million people made these decisions for the entire state of 28 million people. With Tuesday's election behind us, candidates are already counting down to the Texas primary. One key race will determine which Democrat faces Senator John Cornyn in November. I know how to make real change and solve people's real life problems. We'll introduce you to one of the top candidates and show you who has the early edge in the polls. Senator John Cornyn, I looked at your polls. Uh, nobody's beating you, John, nobody. President Trump is confident about Texas Senator John Cornyn's chances in the 2020 election. Cornyn is certain to win the March primary, but it's not clear who his challenger will be next November. We're less than four months away from the primary. Right now, the race for the Democratic nomination looks wide open. The University of Texas and the Texas Tribune polled likely Democratic voters. Retired Air Force officer and former congressional candidate MJ Hagar came out on top. She had 12% support. Seema Hernandez is the next close candidate with 6%. She ran and lost to Beto O'Rourke in last year's Senate primary. State Senator Royce West, Houston City Councilwoman Amanda Edwards, and activist Christina Sinzun Ramirez round out the top five in the poll. The race for Senate will be one of the key races in the Texas primary. We want to help you learn more about the candidates. Joining us now is Democratic candidate Christina Sinsun Ramirez. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So you entered the Senate race fairly recently at the beginning of August. What do you want Texas voters to know about your campaign? Well, you know, I have a decade and a half here in Texas of bringing people together to solve some of our state's biggest problems. I've led some of our most important and largest voting and civil rights organizations. I know that people want someone that's a fighter that understands what they go through. So I've worked, whether that's trying to raise wages for the people who build our homes and make their jobs safer or tackle the crisis of student debt and climate change, I know how to make real change and solve people's real life problems. You've said you were asked to run for U.S. Senate by the people who ran Beto O'Rourke's campaign. What was the reason that you made that run for uh, Senate after that discussion? Well, it took them about two months to convince me. I have a beautiful two-year-old little boy at home, so at first I told them it wasn't the right personal time for me. Um, and I went on a very long walk by myself after they kept bothering me. Um, and look, it's the right, it's not the right personal time for me, but it is the right moment in our state's history for a woman, for a Latina to run. Someone like me that's the daughter of a Mexican immigrant. My mom's the oldest of nine kids. My dad's a white American. My white grandpa used to say we were purebred Irish Mexican Americans. Um, and I knew there was nothing purebred about it, but I know what's best about our state is our diversity. And I know that no matter where you come from, the language you speak, the color of your skin or who you love, that we all want the same things for our children. That we all just want them to be safe, to be healthy, and to go to great schools. So if this is the best way that we can build a political movement in our state to actually have people in office that represent us and will fight for us and bring our diverse state together, then I decided I was all in and that this might not be the right personal moment, but it is the right moment in history for our state. You've said you support mandatory gun buybacks. How do you implement that plan in a state like Texas where gun control policies uh, you know, can be quite divisive? You know, here in our state, you know, I was the best uh, shot in my family growing up, so I support protecting the Second Amendment. But, you know, we've had the four mass most deadly shootings have been here in Texas, the last four. I graduated high school the year of the Columbine shooting. So I've been wearing, waiting my entire adult life to see Congress do very basic things like pass universal background checks, um, ban assault style weapons, and instead we've been teaching a generation of young people to play dead in their classrooms. So if you support a ban, I believe you need to support a buyback. That, that is the best way to get weapons of war out of our communities, out of our streets, and to keep our children and families safe. You're the founder of the organization JOLT, and this really is an organization that mobilizes young Latinos to vote. What was it like creating that, and why do you think an organization like that is necessary in the time we live right now? 
So um, I launched Jolt the week after the November 2016 election when I was uh, six months pregnant. Talk about a, a wrong personal time to start a political <laughs> endeavor. Um, but Jolt was focused on mobilizing young Latino voters. I helped lead an initi initiative through the Texas Youth Power Alliance that registered one in five voters in Texas in 2018. We saw a 500% increase in the youth vote, a 250% increase in the Latino vote. So I know that real democracy, again, will be a threat to people in power, that we are going to get more young people, more people of color, out to vote, more low-income people, and that's how we build a democracy, an economy, and a country for everyone. JOLT has worked to help immigrant families in the past. Uh, DACA goes before the Supreme Court on Tuesday. What are you hoping will be the outcome of the hearing next week? You know, I want to make sure that we're continuing to protect the rights of dreamers. Here in Texas, we have nearly 120,000 dreamers, young people that have lived in our schools and communities that we have extended protection to, that now work and live and go to our schools. I think we need to make sure to continue to protect the rights of dreamers and also work long term to get comprehensive immigration reform for the millions of people in our country that have long worked and contributed here to, especially in Texas, our state's economy. And then we also have to really talk about what the debate around immigration is truly about. I really do not believe that John Cornyn and Donald Trump are just afraid of people like my 62-year-old immigrant Mexican mother, but that they are deeply afraid of people like me, her U.S. citizen daughter that can vote and has a dramatically different vision for my state and country than the one I see today. And to them, I would say they should be afraid because it's going to be this proud immigrant daughter that unseats John Cornyn. What are the other key issues in this race that you are passionate about? Well, the two key issues that I think are really important here in Texas is obviously health care. We have one in six Texans that don't have health care, the highest uninsured rate in the country. You know, the reason why I support Medicare for all isn't just because it's one of the most popular policies in the country. I think it's particularly important for Texas because as long as we have had um, a healthcare industry that has profited, where private insurance companies have profited off of our pain, our suffering, and illness, it has resulted in the most expensive healthcare system in the world with some of the worst outcomes of any industrialized nation. Mm -hmm. That is, by any measure, a failed system. I want the best system, the most uh, affordable system, that will give the best quality care in the richest nation in the world. I think every person should be able to go to the doctor when they are sick um, and have the highest quality healthcare when they need it. Final question. What makes you the best candidate to beat Senator Cornyn? You know, I know what people go through in this state. I think in this race, I may be underestimated. But you can ask any construction company or any politician that ever had to go up against me if they regretted underestimating me and the people that I represent. John Cornyn doesn't represent the Texas of today. He represents a Texas of the past. We need someone that's willing to fight for working families and middle class families. I am that candidate, and I am also the candidate that has gotten people out to vote in Texas, young people, um, Latinos, black, brown, and white folks coming together, LGBTQ and straight. I know how to build a coalition that can actually defeat John Cornyn. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Thanks so much for having me. A deadly disaster leads one Texas pastor to politics. I felt like God was leading me into this at that point. Still didn't want to go, and I just felt like this is what I'm supposed to do now. How a mass shooting led a gun rights advocate to run for the legislature. Julian Castro picks up new support in Texas for his White House bid, but can he keep his campaign alive long enough to take advantage of the endorsements? Beto O'Rourke's bid for the White House is over. The Texan ended his campaign earlier this month. Now some of his high-profile supporters are giving their endorsement to another Texan who's still in the race for president. Eight state lawmakers who previously endorsed O'Rourke now say they'll back Julian Castro in the primary. Castro told the Texas Tribune that four lawmakers from El Paso announced their support, including State Senator Jose Rodriguez, State Representative Joe Moody, who's the House Speaker pro tem, along with Representatives Cesar Blanco and Art Fierro are also backing Castro. 
They're joined by four other Democratic state representatives, Abel Herrero, Oscar Longoria, Ana Maria Ramos, and Jean Wu. The endorsements come as Castro works to keep his struggling campaign alive. Earlier this week, Castro announced that campaign staffers in New Hampshire and South Carolina will be laid off. A Castro spokesperson says the campaign will focus its attention on Iowa and here in Texas. Castro trails in the polls and in fundraising. Last month, Castro said he'd drop out of the race unless he raised $800,000 in donations over the last 10 days of October. The campaign met that goal, but he still has not reached the threshold to get on the stage for the November debate. A new poll shows that less than half of Texas voters plan to vote for Donald Trump in the next year's election. But the poll also shows that none of the Democrats in the race have the support to beat him. The poll asked Texas voters about a series of head-to-head -head matchups. Trump came out ahead each time. Against Julian Castro, Trump led with 46 percent to Castro's 33 percent. The poll also showed Trump beating Joe Biden by seven points in a head-to-head -head matchup. He had the same advantage over Elizabeth Warren in the poll. Bernie Sanders fared best in the poll. The results showed the Vermont senator within five points of the president in a head-to-head -head matchup. A Texas pastor linked to tragedy is now running for a spot at the state capitol. Frank Pomeroy is running for the Texas Senate. He's the pastor at the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs. You may remember Pomeroy lost his daughter in the mass shooting at the church. He says witnessing more mass shootings encouraged him to run for office. But when I saw the way I felt like those people were treated in El Paso and then Midland, Odessa and Dayton, Ohio, those were the ones that really grabbed my attention. I surrounded myself with people of prayer. I felt like God was leading me into this at that point. Still didn't want to go. And I just feel like this is what I'm supposed to do now. Despite the tragedy that claimed his daughter's life, Pomeroy says he remains a strong Second Amendment proponent. He faces an uphill battle. The district is currently represented by Senator Judith Zaffarini. She's been in the legislature for more than 30 years. Thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. We'll be back next week to bring you an in-depth look at Texas politics.